Cheryl Clausen. Well, my first interest in archaeology was probably in, it was either in third or fourth grade, and um, I snuck out of Sunday school and went to the church library. And um, it was just going through the books, and there was a book there by uh, a man named Oscar Ogg, and it was the history of the 26 letters of the alphabet. And I looked through that that morning, and I went back the next Sunday morning and looked through it again, and it was basically biblical archaeology and uh, text, ancient texts, and I thought that was just the coolest thing possible. So I decided then and there, in third grade or fourth grade, to, uh, to be an archaeologist. So that's, that's what I said I was going to be. And then in uh, my freshman year in high school, I started volunteering to dig with the Gilcrease Institute. I was living in Tulsa and uh, was going out with Gregory Perino on different, different digs around northeastern Oklahoma. So from that, I just went, to, went on to university. and it was, It's a single track idea that I was going to do archaeology. Growing up in Tulsa, I, uh, I enjoyed working at the Gilcrease a lot. Um, my father had told me that he didn't want me applying for any scholarships, so I had to go to college someplace where he could afford to pay for me, and that he had an account that he'd been paying into, and um, that would set the parameters. I figured that would have to be an Oklahoma, an in-state school. Well, I wasn't interested in going to any of the Oklahoma schools because everybody I knew was going to either OSU or OU, and I didn't want to be around them. So I um, discovered through a teacher about the University of Arkansas in 1971, and they, um, it was cheaper to go to Arkansas as an out-state student than it was to go to an Oklahoma school as an in-state student. So quite dumb luck, I marched into the University of Arkansas in 1971 when contract work was just getting launched by, um, uh, you know, folks there at the, at the um, Arkansas Archaeological Survey. Michael Schiffer was on the faculty at Arkansas, and it, I couldn't have had better luck than to uh, have chosen that uh, school. So I went in. As an undergrad, I had friends who were graduate students, and every, everybody was all abuzz about Schiffer and the Cache River Archaeological Project, and I sat in on graduate courses with friends, and I had roommates that were graduate students. <clears throat> um, I also had uh, friends who um, were in law school and telling me about this dynamic young law professor named Bill Clinton. And uh, so between the anthropology department and working on Bill Clinton's first political campaign, um, it was just an incredibly exciting place to be and time to be there. Um, I, uh, I did an honors uh, track at Arkansas, and uh, actually I double majored in social welfare and anthropology because I had um, dreams of being on the Olympic volleyball team. And I needed, in those days, athletes had to support themselves somehow. So I thought, okay, I'll do social work, because I can do that anywhere. And um, I, uh, so I got a, a, a dual BA. I got a BSW and a BA in anthropology. Um, and, uh, and anyway, I was doing honors uh, thesis on the Aleutians, and I had a male professor, um, Alan McCartney, and he taught me darkroom techniques and um, got collections for me from the Smithsonian, from World War II um, uh, soldiers who had been on the Aleutian Islands, and so I did an honors thesis looking at um, the, the Near Islands, which are the furthest in the Aleutian chain. and. Um, just had a lot of um, support from him and um, McGimsey and um, Hester Davis and a lot of the graduate women. There were more women graduate students practically than men graduate students there, and um, it was just a just a very dynamic, exciting time to be there. Um, 
So anyway, Alan McCartney, my advisor, um, when I was finishing up my uh, honors thesis, he sat me down one day and handed me a list of schools that he thought I should apply to uh, for graduate school. And I hadn't really thought, I mean, I thought I'd like to go to graduate school, but I hadn't really any idea where I was going to do it or how I was going to do that or how one did that. And um, so I was thinking about maybe I would go into a police academy or maybe I would go into um, uh, forestry. I had thought about that. Um, I wanted to be an archaeologist. I just didn't know if I was going to be able to be an archaeologist. And there was still this volleyball business going on in the background. And uh, I got recruited uh, by the Dallas Athletic Club to play volleyball for them. So I graduated a semester early and moved to Dallas uh, to play ball. And um, meanwhile, got hated it hated the situation in Dallas, uh, loved the volleyball, but um, didn't care for any of that. And uh, then I got a job offer from the Arkansas Archaeological Survey to go back to Fayetteville and uh, work on some projects there. So, um, and then the uh, graduate school uh, acceptance letters started coming. And so I'd gotten in to the places that had been on the list, all but one. Um, and uh, uh, so it was set. I was going to go to graduate school. I, um, I also, um, Schiffer got me into the um, Grasshopper Field School in Arizona in the summer of 75. So I went there and, um, you know, met a lot of people who are still in archaeology at that um, field school. And uh, so then I went to Harvard in 1975. When I graduated, I went to Harvard as a graduate student. So I thought I was going to do Arctic anthropology. And um, there was only one North American archaeologist on the faculty, uh, Stephen Williams. And um, I was more interested in what um, um, I was more interested in, in coastal and um, coastal adaptations, things like that. So, I um, I didn't I didn't make the connections that would have been appropriate to make with Stephen Williams, which I think always goaded him that I um, I just didn't I didn't rise to the potential uh, to work with him and. Uh, um, instead, ended up working with um, person after person. I started out with Jerry Sabloff. He left. And then I was going to work with, um, uh, I can't think of who it is right now, but he moved. He left Harvard and went to Florida. So I didn't have him. Uh, and Sabloff left. And then Ruth Tringham had been on sabbatical uh, for the first two years that I was there. And then she came back. And so I did... Um, I did Old World, Yugoslav, um, 5,000 to 6,000 year old early agriculture work in, um, in Europe. Thought I was going to do a dissertation on the domestication of the pig. Um, didn't want to uh, get pegged as a faunal analyst. <laughs> so I dropped that topic and, uh, and then Ruth uh, left and went to Berkeley. And uh, I ended up getting inherited by um, uh, John Erickson. Um, and he was interested in a lot of um, uh, trace element studies and uh, chemical work and things like that. So according to John, who then also left uh, and went to California, I was the first PhD in the country in archaeological science. Um, so I did a dissertation on coastal North Carolina and looking at shell and doing shell chemistry and um, malacology and you know things that I um, that I, I didn't really uh, get the background in that would warrant me calling myself a malacologist or a chemist or any of those other 
things. <laughs>
that had gone on in the upper Mississippi Valley. And uh, that really, the research into that really informed um, my understanding of what prehistoric shell fishing in a freshwater setting um, should look like, could look like, and didn't look like. Um, that these, uh, you know, shell fishing didn't end because of over-exploitation compared to the hundreds and thousands of tons of shellfish that were taken out in the freshwater shell button industry and they continued to um, muscle those rivers. They continue today to take mussels out of those rivers. So they can sustain 120 years of intensive harvesting and transportation by um, trains and carts and um, I knew that our human exploiters were nowhere near um, uh, working at that kind of intensity in the past and so over exploitation couldn't explain the end of the shell heaping in the um, on the Tennessee and the Green and the Ohio River so what did and uh, like I said that took me into landscape it took me into uh, I'd already was interested in gender um, that's from feminism of the middle 70s and early 80s um, but you know it, it made me think about what women were doing since they're the shellfishers and what men are doing and what um, what were what were they doing why would they stop shellfishing when that's a really easily collected resource um, and um, when did it all really start and did it start all at one time which the um, um, uh, hypsothermal argument would have, you know, predictable date for starting and a predictable date for ending, and it didn't look to me like in, that that the record, the regional records, matched up with what should be happening if the hypsothermal was uh, explaining it. So it just launched me into a whole, a whole new direction with Shell that eventually led me out of Shell altogether, and into things like rock shelters and caves and ritual areas. So now I would say that uh, my research areas are uh, ritual, uh, ritual, ritualizing, um, landscape features that are uh, possible shrine locations. I've recently done work on a gendered perception of landscape, meaning women's, uh, and how do, how do women look at landscape that might be different from how men would look at landscape? What, what, you know, starting with resources and then starting with ritual kinds of sites. What, what, do, uh, what do men and women, what are their needs, their ritual needs? And a lot of these rituals are um, conducted uh, either as individuals or as groups of like individuals. And so that sets up different needs from landscape settings. So that's, that's what I'm doing now, is writing a lot about rituals and beliefs and the archaic period. The, I've, I've settled pretty squarely on the archaic. I have to say, actually, I've, I've got a book manuscript under review right now that's about 16th century Catholicism in Mexico. But um, <laughs> that, that was a hobby. I've always had a hobby. And my hobbies always end in a book, and then I moved to the next hobby. So the shell button industry was a hobby. And now this 16th century Catholicism in Mexico was a hobby. Um, I don't know what my next hobby is going to be. Milestones in my career. Well, um, I mean, I could start before a career. And um, one would be, I can remember when I was a freshman, my first semester, my freshman year, I took five anthropology courses. I was so eager to do anthropology and archaeology, I signed up for everything I could possibly fit in. And I remember sitting in Alan McCartney's Arctic Prehistory course as a first semester freshman. And he, it was, must have been the third week of class. And uh, up comes a slide, and I realize he is in the slide doing an excavation in the Aleutian Islands. And 
I had read archaeology, I had even done archaeology, but it was always something that somebody else was doing. And I don't really know what I thought, how I thought I was going to fit into that, but I saw him in that slide and I thought, oh, that could be me running an excavation in some remote place. And so that was just a really liberating sort of thing. And then when he um, empowered me with a, um, a thesis topic and thesis collections and, and taught me the darkroom skills so that I could take photographs of all these artifacts and lithic artifacts and a few bone and, and uh, uh, ivory artifacts and then left me to do it. You know, that, that was a real milestone too. Um, Going to the Grasshopper Field School, you know, that was just one more of this is how you do it. This is, these are the logical steps and somehow I'm just miraculously falling into these logical steps for how one goes, how one gets to a career. And then um, getting accepted at Harvard. I got accepted, like I said, every place I applied except for one. And, um, uh, Harvard called up and said, you've got two days to say yes or no. And theirs was the, the um, maybe the fourth letter of acceptance that I'd gotten. And everybody else had given me like two weeks or four weeks or something to decide. Um, and, and money, they gave me money. And so I, I said, oh, sure, fine. I didn't even hang up the phone. I said, okay, I'll come there. Um, I didn't really, I mean, I hung up the phone and looked at a map. Where's Harvard University? <laughs> and, um, uh, but certainly being there and feeling like, okay, there's a whole lot of people, including the people on the faculty at Harvard who must think you're really smart. So, okay, now you need to be really smart. You need to do the work that, that's behind that impression and you need to do the work that fulfills those expectations and um, uh, so certainly getting into graduate school and and having that vote of confidence um, was was a big milestone um, uh, you know just the predictable things like getting tenure and and um, getting full professor and um, The other, the other big one that I think is, you know, something that you'd be more interested in is, um, I uh, in in nineteen ninety one, my university started an exchange program with the University of the Americas in Puebla, in Cholula, Mexico, and um, I didn't, ha I hadn't had much interest in traveling internationally. Uh, I had had that Yugoslavia experience. I worked in graduate school. Uh, in Yugoslavia uh, for two summers. I worked in France for a summer. Um, but I wasn't really driven to go out of the country or overseas or whatever. And something about going to Mexico appealed to me. And uh, I went and I spent a semester there teaching in the archaeology program in, in English. That's what they wanted, those classes in English. And fell in love with Mexico. And uh, I went back in 92, uh, did exchange again. I went in uh, 94 on sabbatical. In 96, I started uh, going about five times a year. In 98, I started taking students to Mexico. In 2001, I bought a house in Tosco. And uh, about, so starting somewhere around 2000, I was reading more and more about Mesoamerican things and slowly came to realize that Mexico was a living laboratory for what my interests, how my interests were developing in the Eastern US and the archaic for landscape use. So in 2006, I started going all over Guerrero, Mexico, Morelos, Mexico, the state of Mexico, the state of Puebla. I was going to all the sites that I could go to. I was going to churches. I was participating in Catholic pilgrimages. I, um, and then in 2005, 2006, 2007, 
again in 10, 11, and 12, I started going with Nahuatl speakers to rain calling ceremonies on mountaintops, sinkholes, caves, and um, taking notes furiously, writing articles furiously as I realized about um, shrine sites and mountaintops and caves and waterfalls and rock shelters and uh, and the potential all those places held in the eastern United States for um, trying to understand ritual life, um, pilgrimages, pilgrimages circuits. Uh, so I'd say that really, really about 2010 is when I had this big aha moment about this is this is how you can come to understand rituals and beliefs in the archaic is by um, looking at how landscape is used and what landscape means and what these different features mean and offerings and and making the economics of making offerings and the the ceremonies and all the prep and the path clearance and um, I mean, it just, wow, just a huge packet of questions and potential that uh, I realized. So that was, that was really a major, um, a major turning point in what I'm doing now. And again, I say it's, it's, it's for my interest in Eastern U.S. understandings. I'm not, I've never thought that I could become a Mesoamericanist. Um, or even wanted to be a Mesoamericanist, but it, but the uh, both the archaeology and the ethno archaeology and the ethno history are so rich for um, helping us understand how the how the archaic and the woodland and the Mississippian unfolded in the Eastern U.S. I have to say I've been very fortunate. I haven't had all that many setbacks, but the ones I have have been more my own personality than, than um, institutional. I'd have to say that now one of the impediments that's showing up is, um, you know, I don't have the GIS. I don't have the, the skills to do my own maps uh, or the kinds of maps that my articles demand. And I can see that that's beginning to sort of impact what I what I write about. Uh, the other thing is that the uh, the demands of journal publishing are getting more and more onerous um, in in terms of the hoops you have to jump through for your article to come out. It's not a problem to submit it and wait for the reviews. The problems uh, are show up as I age beyond a lot of this new technology. Uh, the problems become in actual the, the, the physical requirements of, of the photographs, of the tables, of the, um, the ORCID uh, ID, the, um, the uploading sequences, you know, those kinds of things are starting to feel like impediments. Um, uh, having to pay for uh, illustrations has come back. My career started where you had to pay for illustrations, and that went away. And then, in some cases, that's coming back again. So you need subvention money in order to publish an article. So I can see that there are going to be some um, there's some technological uh, hurdles that are that are beginning to um, interfere with me sitting down and writing an article. <laughs> I find it easier to write a book than it is to write a, uh, an article. I've written more books in the last 10 years than I've written articles um, because they are, they're, are, they are easier to do. <clears throat> in my mind, uh, my biggest contribution to archaeology is, has been problematizing the shell mounding. And, um, I've gone through a series of different hypotheses for them, and, and in different five-year increments, I favored one over the other. Um, I have a colleague who has complained to me about um, not, you know, I th well, you convinced me of that hypothesis last year, and now this year you're saying something different about it, and I'm, you know, so I, 
I continue to work through uh, data. I continue to have um, ideas about what it is that could be going on and how to investigate uh, those potentials. But uh, I would say that and then moving into, uh, I, I want to situate these, I have all along wanted to situate these shell heaps with uh, high numbers of burials in them as uh, uh, mortuary facilities uh, with a lot of attendant mortuary ritual associated with them. And so uh, problematizing those shell heaps out of villages and into mortuaries and then uh, shell heaps as being parts of a uh, ritual circuit that might also involve uh, rock shelter sites and rock art sites and um, village sites and non-shell burial areas and hilltop sites and river bottom sites and um, you know I, so I guess I guess that's what I would like to hear that people think that I did <laughs> for archaeology for Eastern U.S. archaeology. It's definitely not the same field as it was in 1967 when I started digging. And Greg Perino had a drawstring bag on his belt in which any time we uncovered charcoal, he would add the charcoal to his bag. Um, you know, from that to um, to what's going on now, and now it's the ethical issues, it's the it's all the technology, it's um, you know even questions like is it ethical to dig, um, which which sits at the the heart of. Uh, archaeology um, and and as I sit through ethics discussions I find myself teetering on the edge of thinking that I'm becoming unethical or um, you know that I've got to um, rethink things that I'm thinking or doing or would hope to do um, as maybe things I shouldn't be doing or, or from the technology standpoint can't be doing. Um, I would say there are probably more, I feel more constraints on my ability to be an archaeologist now than I, certainly than I felt when I was an undergraduate, certainly more so than I've ever felt from being female. Well, I guess a major challenge for archaeology, and, and maybe it, <clears throat> I mean, maybe it's not, uh, is, is how to stay a cohesive profession. And maybe it doesn't need to stay a cohesive profession. Um, um, but, you know, we used to talk, we used to spend a lot of time talking about how archaeology was part of anthropology. And uh, I think more and more the conversation is how archaeology is archaeology. Um, so it, you've got the anthropological archaeologists are um, by and large now the folks who are working with um, in public archaeology. <laughs> um, and uh, so, so, you know, part of me thinks how do we, how do we stay together as a profession? Um, and, and I guess I wonder, is that even a goal that, um, that the SAA has? I mean, I would think the SAA, my impression of the SAA is that the goal is to stay together, to keep all the disparate um, uh, strands of archaeologists together, and certainly the, um, the opening up to greater and greater participation by Europeanists and Asia, Asian or you know, folks whose focus is on Asia or Europe or Africa or whatever would seem to b reflect an effort to try to keep, um, keep it all together. But um, beyond the geographies, I wonder if the, um, 
the idea of ethics and what's ethical and what isn't ethical isn't going to be where the splits, um, irreparable splits, might, might happen. My hopes for the future of archaeology uh, to stay on totally safe ground would be that, uh, that um, funding from the federal government and state government and city governments continues. Um, that uh, there are jobs. That academics doesn't get so onerous and so um, Mickey Mouse that, um, that there's no academic archaeology. So I hope that there is an academic archaeology and a and a in an intellectually um, healthy and vibrant um, way as it seems to me we started in my career we started in a very vibrant intellectual um, arena anti intellectualism is um, is a worry, so uh, I, I would hope that the uh, SAA and the profession of archaeology doesn't get so anti-intellectual that um, um, that you don't need a PhD in it anymore <laughs> or a master's degree in it anymore. Um, so I, I I don't know what the future of it's going to be. I don't know what the future of of me in archaeology is going to be, let alone what the whole profession's going to be. Um, I, I retired so that I could write. Um, I was tired of teaching and um, needed the, I felt, I, basically I retired so I could have a sabbatical. <laughs> um, and uh, uh, I, I just hope, I just hope that there are um, places for people who I have you know, who are intrigued by the past and intrigued by ideas and in, intrigued by the scientific method, um, that, there's, that there's a place for them to go and, and jobs that they will find fulfilling.